deep in the mountains of West Virginia lies a wayward fragment of the far north. It is a place of heath barrens and spruce forests, of bogs and crow-haunted meadows, of pale rocks blasted by the wind, of boulder fields and hemlock groves and rhododendron hells. It is a phantasmagoria known as the Dolly Sods Wilderness. And it was there that I set off for an adventure in the last days of a fading summer. My jumping off place was the Bear Rocks Trailhead. I set out under a chicory blue sky with a backpack full of gear and enough provisions for three nights. Ahead, the distant hardwood canopy was tinged with autumn color. The serrated rows of spruce trees looked almost black. On the heath barren, the blueberry and huckleberry leaves were beginning to show some red. Ferns were yellowing and browning and oranging. I kicked up dust as I walked, and I knew that the parched earth wouldn't yield much drinking water as long as I remained in the northern sods. As I walked, the landscape shifted from heath to spruce forest to sphagnum bog, where cotton grass swayed in the breeze and gentians blossomed at my feet. I crossed Red Creek for the first of many times to come and rested in the shade of the hemlocks. Before leaving, I topped off my water bottles and filled my bag. The creek would have been my last water source for nearly 24 hours. With a heavy pack, I climbed a wooded hillside where the bracken was still green. Then I stepped out into the open and felt the warmth of the sun on my face. And, as I gazed over the miles of open country, a warm feeling welled up inside me, as if I'd swallowed a glass of good bourbon. There's something about the long views of the Dolly Sods that makes me feel like I've come home. The smell of fall was on the air. Goldenrods lined the path. Grasshoppers sprang across it. Viburnum berries ripened, and so did blueberries. I picked and ate a handful of them in the waist-high thicket. I took the trail slow, but felt as if I couldn't possibly take it slowly enough to get my fill of the countryside. Just when I found my trail legs, I gained the ridge where I planned to camp for the night. 
I wanted a campsite with a view. I soon found one. After setting up camp and rehydrating my chicken dinner, I explored the ridge. It was full of boulder fields and of white rocks slanting and shattered and carved by the wind. I searched for firewood among the scattered spruce and mountain ash, and I managed to collect a single armload. It would be enough for one evening. Back at camp, I ate my dinner and started a fire and watched the sun going down over Canaan Valley. I could pick out individual cars churning up dust on the gravel roads below. Gradually, the lights came on on the valley floor. I was a silent observer, standing on the edge of wilderness and civilization, not quite fully belonging to either as long as I remained in the woods. It made me feel both more and less alone, like watching a train leave the station. But I was content to be reminded that civilization would still be there when I was finished roaming the wilderness for a few days. The night deepened. A hush fell over the world, broken only by the sounds of coyotes and barred owls. Overhead, the Milky Way streaked across the black void of the sky. The breeze felt warm, the fire warmer. It was the kind of night that makes an entire trip worthwhile. I awoke in the blue hour before sunrise. Down in the valley, a motionless fog turned hilltops into floating islands. It had been a damp night, and so I laid out some of my things to dry, and then I retrieved my bear canister and made breakfast.
I ate it slowly while surveying the valley. Occasionally, a light pierced the fog as shops opened and people began their work days. Eventually, a hazy sun rose, but it was too weak to dry my gear, nor could it reach the valley floor. By the time I broke camp, the fog had barely stirred. Once I was on the trail, the sun vanished entirely. The rest of the day was a perpetual dusk, a crepuscular noon, the kind of day where you can't tell the time by looking at the sky. Despite my low water supply, I took my time exploring the pale formations of Rocky Ridge. I found sandy places and rock windows and pigskin puffballs fruiting in a mossy cleft. The trail was nearly impossible to follow. It led me into dead ends and lookout points, campsites, and impassable heath thickets. It took me a long time to navigate that Paleolithic maze, and I left without discovering a fraction of its secrets. By the time I could see Canaan Valley again, the fog had lifted. I climbed one last high point on the ridge and then began a long and gradual descent from heath to hardwoods to cove forest. On the big stone coal trail, I entered a narrow tunnel through the rhododendron. The path was full of roots exposed by the muddy runoff. Soon my feet were wet and my pants muddy up to the knees. I often used my trekking poles to test a foothold, and sometimes they sank two feet into the sodden ground. Eventually, I climbed down far enough to find running water again, and I stopped to refresh myself.
Halfway through the day, I crossed Stone Coal Run and stopped to watch the falls spilling over the dark rock. Then I began searching for the place known as Lion's Head, an exposed outcropping near the top of Breathed Mountain. I had some trouble finding it, but finally I crashed through the trees and stumbled out upon the fissure rock atop the Lion's Head. Somewhere below, Red Creek cut its way through the gorge. I enjoyed the view for a while and then decided to take a different route back down to the trail. It was shorter but more difficult, much more difficult. There was no path that I could find. It was like climbing down a rock slide. I lowered myself from one rock face to another, sometimes sliding down a tilted rock that I knew I wouldn't be able to climb back up if I reached a dead end. It was among the most dangerous things I've ever done in the woods, and I wouldn't do it again. Flat ground was a miracle. Back on the trail, I returned to the Stone Coal Run crossing and found a campsite near the creek. It was a damp place. The hemlocks dripped. The rocks seemed to perspire. Mounds of spongy moss glowed in the gloom. Mushrooms stood in varying states of decay. I craved a fire, but thought there was no chance at starting one in such a place. Yet I had picked up some birch bark earlier in the day, and it made for remarkable tinder. I soon had a small fire to cheer me and to dry my gear. Somehow it stayed burning even though all the wood was damp. As soon as I finished my dinner, hunger gave way to fatigue. I crawled into my tent. It smelled like wet socks, but it was dry and comfortable inside. Lying on my back, I saw that there was still enough light in the sky to make out the shapes of tree branches. I fell asleep looking at them and listening to the murmur of the creek and the hiss and crackle of the fire. I awoke to the sound of wing beats. Some large bird was flying from limb to limb in the treetops, but I couldn't see it through the fog. My breakfast was coffee and oatmeal. While I ate, I heard voices on the far side of the creek and watched several backpackers set out in the dim light. I was in no hurry to join them until I felt a mist on my face. Then I packed up as quickly as possible and hit the trail with a smell of campfire smoke on the air. I headed back towards Lion's Head and then diverged onto a new section of trail. Yellow leaves fell in the breeze. The trail followed a steep and rocky descent toward Red Creek. The sound of water grew louder with every step. 
After a while, I could see flowing water through a break in the trees, and soon I came out at the edge of the creek. The water level was low, but I could see that there was no avoiding getting wet. So I took off my shoes, slung them around my neck, and stepped into the current. It was stronger than it looked, and colder. Above Red Creek, the hills rose into the mist. From there, it was a long hike north along the creek. The trail was a narrow ribbon of rocks and mud. It repeatedly climbed high above the creek and then dropped through the bottom of a hollow. It was dim and confined. Everything seemed to be pressing in on me. The air, the rhododendrons, the very earth itself. I stopped frequently to take notes, or to consult the map, or to relieve the pain in my ankles. By the time I reached the forks of Red Creek, it was well afternoon, and I was tired of the cove forest. I craved the open meadows and the fresh air. I realized that I hadn't seen the sun in the better part of two days, and I craved it, too. The forks was a good place for a break, so I filtered water and ate a tuna wrap for lunch. As if in answer to my plea, the sun came out and turned the water into liquid copper. The climb out of the forks was like a jagged stone staircase, but at the top, I was rewarded with the open sky. Finally, I was out of the cove forest and back in the meadows. I stopped to suck in a few greedy lungfuls of the dry, fresh air and to feel the sunshine on my face. I felt like laughing. The miles that followed were effortless. I passed through alternating bands of meadow and spruce on my way to Blackbird Knob, where the beech trees were still shockingly green. I fell in love with the sods again while walking out in the open. The smell of the air transported me back to hunting trips with my dad in northern Michigan. Fields of grass swayed like grain. Goldenrods and asters leaned over the path. I stopped to watch a group of hikers picking their way single file through the quagmire that is Dobbin grade. It began to look like rain. Dark clouds were moving in fast, and I could see sheets of rain falling in the distance. The temperature dropped. The wind changed directions. I had planned to camp in the meadow beneath the stars, but now I abandoned that idea and sought the shelter of the woods instead. Near the north end of Raven Ridge, I found a good campsite in a stand of maples speckled with autumn color. I made camp and settled in for the evening.
After dinner, I built a big fire and brought out my quilt and clothing to dry. It was a much cooler evening than the previous two, but I didn't notice. I removed my socks and shoes and set them by the fire and stretched out my wrinkled feet so that they might dry too. The heat of the fire was a familiar medicine. For two hours after dark, I sat entertained by the fire. Once again, I knew the satisfaction of watching a campfire slowly consume the fuel I had collected. I needed nothing else. The stars glittered beyond the treetops. The hills echoed with the howling of coyotes. The wind died, and the rain never came. In the morning, I broke camp in the light of my headlamp. I wasted no time. It was only a few miles to the car, but I wanted to see the sunrise. I didn't need the headlamp for long. Out in the open, it was already light enough to see the trail clearly. It had been a cold night. Every fern and flower and blade of grass was glazed with frost. I hurried to get a view of the eastern sky, and when I did, I saw that the horizon was rimmed with a pre-dawn glow. The sun had not yet risen. And so, I was able to walk into the sunrise. I saw the first light of day igniting the treetops on the far side of the meadow. I saw the fresh morning rays touching the distant ridges, waking them one by one from their frosty repose. I watched as the liquid dawn spilled onto every leaf and fern and tuft of cotton grass. After three nights and nearly 30 miles, I was almost back at the trailhead where I began. Once again, I remembered that one of the best things about a backpacking trip is emerging from it with a new appreciation for the comforts of home. I felt grateful for the beauty, the vastness, and the lessons of the wilderness, and I took comfort in the knowledge that I would return to it before too long. <laughs>